when we're talking about the delivery of material to the uh, to the earth, one of the things we we were talking about last week was um, platinum, and you know, because platinum and iridium are two of the platinum group metals, and they are frequently associated with impact type events because they're very common in asteroids and meteorites and possibly comets as well. And so we found that one of the discoveries is some of the studies we were looking at last week showed that first of all, there was uh, a platinum spike found in the Greenland ice cores. And then that was followed up by a study of terrestrial sedimentary cores, which also discovered the existence of a platinum spike. We haven't yet talked about the, the studies showing that there is the discovery of iridium and osmium also associated with the Younger Dryas boundary. But that's pretty convincing evidence that, you know, something of a cosmic nature did actually happen. Platinum, as it turns out, where we left it last week was possibly, according to some researchers, important to ancient peoples. That's where we left it off in that I quoted from a book uh, by Lawrence, the late Lawrence Gardner called Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark. It was published in 2003. And in there, you know, he's saying that correctly, that is generally cited that in encyclopedias and reference books, the, the platinum group metals, which for, for um, ease of, of talking about, we usually will just call the, the PGMs, the platinum group metals, came to our attention in the 19th century, and perhaps the be of which the best known was palladium at the time. Palladium uh, was typically used by jewelers and alloyed with gold uh, to produce a metal popularly known as white gold. So it is said, quoting here now, um, Lawrence Gardner, uh, that palladium was first discovered in Brazil, California, and the Urals, all three, in 1803. And it was named after the asteroid Pallas, right? Now look up, while I'm doing this, Kyle, you look up Pallas in Greek mythology. So iridium, osmium, and rhodium are also given the same date of recognition with ruthenium following in 1843. Then he says something very interesting. However, it is now plain from discoveries, and of course, this uh, requires independent verification, which is always important to do in, in good science. But he says, however, it is now plain from discoveries relating to the distant BC years that the ancients were fully aware of the individual properties of these platinum group metals. And in uh, he had earlier discussed the iridium crystal and along with platinum, iridium, the other platinum group metals are palladium, rhodium, osmium, and ruthenium. Because of the ultimate strengths of the metals, they are now used in surgical, optical, and dental instruments, crucibles, thermocouples, machine bearings, electrical switch contacts, and all manner of precision devices down to the tipping of needles and pen nibs. Iridium crystal glows with a transparent color like any precious gemstone. The name iridium was applied in 1803 by virtue of its iridescence. And iridescence comes from the Latin iris, which means rainbow, right? So iridium is brought to earth by meteorites, it's an extraterrestrial metal, and it can form its own glass-like rock. And some of this stuff is showing up in these impact boundaries, including the Younger Dryas boundary. Now, according to Lawrence Gardner, there was an ancient term called sapir, or sapir, S-A-P-P-I-R, which was the term in the ancient uh, Middle East um, for this iridium crystal. Um, so he also makes a reference and suggests that perhaps some of the old Freemasons had traditions about this, um, which could, which is an interesting place to explore. And we could do that at some point, once we've laid a good solid foundation of science. Iridium is a very rare element on earth. 
but geologists have discovered its existence in quantities up to 30 times greater than the norm in crustal layers where meteorites containing the substance have landed. And then he says, um, goes on to say, and again, this is all subject to independent verification, but he laid the groundwork before he passed away. I think he laid the groundwork for exploring this possibility and giving it more credibility when he says that the Sumerians and the ancient Egyptians clearly knew about the properties of gold and of how to ally it with other noble metals. And then he makes again another reference to Freemasonry and alchemical adepts who are also, he claims, familiar with the working of the PGMs, which just like gold could be taken to a higher vibratory state according to a lot of uh, references throughout the alchemical literature. This opens up some other impl interesting implications here, if they did, and it's something that would be great to explore further. Um, this idea that that um, platinum may have, uh, and the, the platinum group metals may have actually been worked by ancient peoples. So the one of the, the, the properties of, of the platinum group metals is that they uh, have high melting points and the ability to stay stable at high temperatures. Their oxidation and reduction properties uh, are such that they are extremely resistant to corrosion. The industrial processes, as we talked about a little bit, we find that their widespread technological and commercial applications because of its unique chemical and physical properties. But the interesting thing to me is that it's a catalyst or it's an ingredient for manufacturing processes. Um, consumer industrial items made with platinum and other, other PGMs include such items as flat panel monitors, glass fiber, medical tools, computer hard drives, nylon and razors, among others. Uh, automotive catalytic converter applications are the largest current users of PGMs, and the demand is growing. What else can we say about it? Uh, both platinum and palladium continue to be very rare, and much of the world's platinum production comes from the small western bush veld, which is a 550 square mile, square kilometers, that accounts for over 70% of the world's supply. So the Bushveld igneous complex is a, often referred to as a layered igneous intrusion within the, Earth's within the Earth's crust, which has been tilted and eroded, and now outcrops around what appears to be the edge of a great geological basin located in South Africa. The Bushveld Igneous Complex contains some of the richest ore deposits on Earth. The reserves of platinum group metals, platinum, palladium, osmium, iridium, rhodium, and ruthenium are the world's largest. In addition, there are also vast quantities of iron, tin, chromium, titanium, and vanadium. Gabbro is a type of rock that is quarried from there. Gabbro is the host rock for, for these platinum group metals. And so the Bushveld likely, uh, I will sh do a share screen here, the, even going back to the 70s, we find the first evidence that the Bushveld was impact origin, which would explain why it is such a concentrated source of these precious metals. Now, it may turn out that a lot that these metals that are have various purposes, and we've talked about industrial and technological purposes. What interests me especially though is the idea of biological functions of these particular metals. But we see here this this obvious correlation between, for example, in, impact structures and the presence of these unique metals. Can you see it here? See it? Yeah, we see yeah. it. Yeah, and that. that's actually the inner core of the thing. It really reaches out much bigger than that. It's and it's also what, what is this? Cute. What is this coloring? Is that false coloring or or natural satellite imaging? I imagine it's natural. It's been highly intensified and enhanced to bring out the features. You can see them much clearer. That's amazing. Yeah. So South Africa, and so this is, is the world's richest source of these platinum group metals. Um, 
Is that also one of the oldest impacts? I can't remember the age. It's old. One. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. It, it's very old. Okay. Well, you sent me down a serious rabbit hole over here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we like that. <laughs> We're we trying will. to figure it we out. still see yeah. you. So, I looked up, uh, oh yeah, well the whole, the whole 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science goes into the rabbit holes with us. So it wouldn't look any different <laughs> to you guys. <laughs> okay. But, um, so I looked up palace in Greek, mythology. Greek mythology and I kept coming up with, uh, Olympus and reading about Olympus is very interesting. It's very, uh, sounds like the Kuiper belt or yep. something like that. Um, Immortal horses in the homes of the gods. Yeah. that come and go <laughs> as they please. And then we looked up the etymology of the word palace. And of course it goes back to the Latin word palladium. If you look up palladium, which is spelled different in Greek mythology, the Latin is P A L A T I U M. But in Greek mythology, mythology, it's palladium. Okay. P a l l a d i u m, which was uh, a wooden statue. Yes, a wooden statue that fell from heaven and was kept at Troy. And for as long as it was preserved, the city was safe. And it is associated with Athena. Um. Yeah. So, but I couldn't find. What are we looking exactly? for? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Did we do okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it seems to suggest. What you found seems to suggest then there is certainly a cosmic association. Yes. Falls yes, from heaven. Like, yeah. Now, that's interesting, see, because I just mentioned the biological implications of the injection of these metals, these catalytic metals into the Earth's biosphere. So now in the myth, we've got this association between wood, right? Wood yep. that fell from heaven. Right. Now, that's pretty bizarre. I, I see it. The it reason is. I had you look it up is because I knew there was going to be some bizarre correlations <laughs> that showed up in there. Um, because I think one of the working premises that we're, we're, we're exploring here is that there's evidence that peoples in ancient times had greater familiarity with some of these things than they've been given credit for. Yeah. Yeah. So... Going back to the biological implications, there's another study I ran across years ago when I was first exploring this that I thought may have relatively interesting implications and it needs further exploration. And I don't won't claim to fully understand all of the implications of this of this research. But this is going back to an article that appeared in Scientific American in 1995. And this is what they reported on, um, that there were, um, let's see, oh, here we go. Okay. Chemist Thomas J. Mead and molecular biologist John F. Kayem have been exploring how electrons move in large molecules. Such processes underlie many important biological phenomena, for instance, the conversion of sunlight into plant food by the magnesium chlorophyll model depends on stimulation of electron movement through the chlorophyll by the incoming protons. Mead and Kayam's molecule of study was DNA. They devised a way of binding atoms of ruthenium a platinum group metal, to ribose, one of the backbone components of the helical chains of DNA. Ruthenium atoms act like electrical conductors into and out of the molecule. They have the added virtue of neither disrupting nor distorting its overall shape, which, of course, is one of the characteristics of any catalytic substance or enzyme is that they that they can trigger a response, a type of process, without destroying or modifying the original substance, right? So, ruthenium atoms act like electrical conductors, connectors, into and out of the molecule. They have the added virtue of neither disrupting nor distorting its overall shape. 
Kyle, while you're at it, look up the word a catalyst. Look up catalyst. We'll go with that one. What is a catalyst? Let's define that before we move on. Okay, from, I guess it's just the Google dictionary here. A substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change. There we go. Okay. Although there has been a long history of using such metals to understand DNA, the ruthenium ribose combination revealed something extraordinary. The researchers examined the electrical properties of short lengths of double helix DNA in which there was a ruthenium atom at each end of one of the strands. Mead and Kayam estimated from earlier studies that a short single strand of DNA ought to conduct up to 100 electrons per second. Imagine their astonishment when they measured the rate of flow along the ruthenium-doped double helix. The current was up by a factor of more than 10,000 times over a million electrons per second. It was as if the double helix was behaving like a piece of molecular wire. So what does that, I don't know, but it sure does seem to me that that is the entrance into a rabbit hole there that needs to be followed up on and looked at. And, and when I yeah. stumbled across <laughs> that, it, it, it really did confirm my suspicions that perhaps the PGMs did play a, a critical biological function. Um, in evolutionary processes. And so when you have impacts that not only cause mass extinctions, they're also injecting into the Earth's, uh, you know, atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, all of these exotic materials. The question is, is do those materials then have a biological effect? Is there a biological consequence to the, to the enhancement of those materials into the into the terra sphere. I'll use the term terra sphere to encompass all of the, the, the areas I just uh, just mentioned. And, that's and, and if there, sorry, if there is biological life in some cases within these objects that inject them into the planet, then they're sitting there in a soup of that stuff that is doing this kind of thing all the time. That's also interesting to me. Mm-hmm. So if they're not in stasis because of the cold or whatever, but if, you know, once they get close to the sun, they start warming up, things start happening, and all these metals are mixed in with all these uh, biological materials, then... Yeah. Maybe that's how we live uh, seven or eight hundred years. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back, and I uh, just wanted to share this uh, image of the ruthenium metal. Mm. Mm. Very Terminator-esque. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. That is really cool. Is. So it looks like it has magical properties. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's magic. Yeah, I don't even yeah. know what I'm looking at. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, what we should do is we should encapsulate some of it and then let Mike ingest some of it and then see if he is still still normal afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bradley, pull up the um, the field ion microscope photograph of the iridium-tipped needle. All right, I can get that back. Yeah, that, that was, uh, yeah, that's a pretty cool image, which we'll, we'll come back to because the geometry inherent in that is quite remarkable. But that's through a light refraction um, using the field ion microscope, which was invented by, um, okay, let me see, Erwin Wil- Wilhelm Muller, who invented not only the field emission electron microscope, but also the field ion microscope. So he was considered to be the first person to ever saw an atom. And he took this photograph of a, of a uh, light being refra- refracted from a tip, a very sharp tip of, a, a, uh, of an iridium needle. And it formed a very, and I have a color version 
should be. Oh, I yes. thought this was platinum. This is iridium. I think that one's, well, I think he did platinum and iridium. That one, I think that might be the platinum. This, this one is the iridium. Let's see. Okay. If can... Yeah. Just, just from previous presentations, I had in my head that this was the platinum. Yeah. You might be so, right. Yeah, let's, that, see iridium. Could... let's see iridium. Cool. Let's see. Yeah. So that really, that looks a lot like a cymatics pattern. I mean, doesn't uh, it? Yeah. If you look up the, you know, a Chaladni plate or something, you, that's very much what it looks oh, like. This is, this is iridium. This uh, one is iridium, yes. Like electron, electron scan or something? What, what am I looking yeah, at? Yeah, they excite it and the electrons are emitted. And as they're emitted, they form these patterns. So, yeah, we're, we're going to come back because I've done an interesting analysis of this geometry and it shows up in some rather, rather interesting places. So um, it, it would be worth coming back to that. 